just call the meeting to order and I'll read my little statement here. I call this meeting to order. This is the February 16th, 2021 meeting of the Johnson City Public Library Board of Directors. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are meeting virtually and are being recorded as allowed by Executive Order 16 by Governor Lee. Yes. Please indicate your understanding that this is our official meeting by saying yes. Kathy, please call for a roll call of the Board of Directors. Tony Warner. Here. Yes. David, David Gamer. Here. Sarah Davis. Yes. Jennifer Dixon. Yes. Susie Williams. Here. John Hunter. Scott Jeffress. Yes. Georgina Washington. Yes. Daryl Carter. Yes. Thank you. Okay, we have a quorum. Um, and first action is approval of the minutes. Um, I, we all got copies of them in the packet. Anybody have any corrections or questions or comments? Okay, then could we, I have a motion to approve the minutes of our last meeting. So Jay, moved. Scott. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, we have the minutes approved. Um, treasurer's report. Kathy? Yes, I have it. Here. Oh, Sarah? Good. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the operating account, um, January 2021, at the end of uh, January, the total revenues are at 73 and nine tenths percent and total expenditures are at 53 and one tenths of the budgeted amounts. The personnel account group remains 4% under budget. This is due to a vacancy in the library's management team. However, our new technical service, uh, okay, Service manager begins work on March 1st, and we have another three payroll month in March. Except for support services, except for support services, all account groups are under budget. Support services includes annual one-time costs for insurance and for the annual audit. And that is the January operating account. If there are any questions, please speak. I had a one question. I noticed that Johnson City had 75% of their um, allotments and Washington County had 50% for both the general fund, I mean, for the general library and also for, it was 4102, 4101, 4102, and then also on the Washington County Imagination, both, both of those had a, you know, difference of 50% and 75%. So is Washington County behind on that? Sarah, do you mind if I speak to that? Go ahead, Kathy. I know they don't give us as much. So well, they, they actually speak to are a little bit behind on sending the quarterly allocations. But I will say that Washington County, since all of this went out, has uh, sent the third quarter appropriation. So we're at exactly where we need to be and that will be reflected in the February statement. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, in that case, I'll take a motion to approve. I'll make the motion. Thank you, Susan. We approve. Second. Second. Second, Daryl. All in favor say aye, please. Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, thank you very much. Um, Sarah, would you do the Imagination Library report? I'd be happy to. Um, at the end of January, revenues are at 63 and 4 tenths percent. I believe we have that up, don't we, somewhere? Okay, uh, I'll just continue until we locate it. 
and expenditures are at 59% of budgeted amounts. At seven months into the fiscal year, both should be around 58 and four tenths. Donations and pass-through funds from the Governor's Early Literacy Foundation are greatly reduced this year. We are seeing an increase in enrollments in the Imagination Library program. The most recent invoice shows a net increase of 70 enrollments over the previous month. So that makes the current enrollment 5,211 young people. Any questions? Comments, questions? Just a comment. It's great to see that we got 70 new um, young people that are signed up. It is a good thing. We're, we're very happy to see that. And Celeste Madley is doing an outstanding job picking up those enrollments from our birthing hospitals. Okay. Can I have a motion? For what are our birthing hospitals? Can you, are they more than Med Center and Franklin Woods? No, ma'am, that's, those are the only two, but it encompasses so many people from outside of this area that she actually enrolls all the children that where she picks up those applications and the affiliate uh, for which they are located, you know, where they live, they are, they are of course charged to pay for that child's uh, enrollment. But we, she might pick up as many as 150 every couple of weeks of which it seems like we have about, you know, a fourth to a third of those. When you say she picks up, what do you mean? Celeste actually drives to the birthing hospitals and picks up paper enrollments. When the child is born, the nurse, the charge nurse, when all of the paperwork's given to the new parents, one of those forms is actually an enrollment form in the Imagination Library. And it used to be that the little engine that could book was given to the new parent at the hospital. And that was funded through the Nicewanger Foundation. However, those funds ran out and an increase that we're seeing, of course, in our monthly bill is because we are now paying for that little engine that could the welcome book, whereas they used to get it at the hospital when the child was born. And, and Celeste all right. took all those books to the hospital as well. Celeste does an outstanding job working with the, uh, the hospitals in so many different ways and making sure that uh, every child that is eligible is enrolled. Very good. Great. Can I have a motion on the Imagination Library report? So moved. Thank you, David. Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Moving right along to the director's report. Right. Uh, so January was, um, again, another good month for us overall. Um, we continue to see these fabulous increases in digital circulation over last year. Um, so January marked the first full month that we have had a new service called Hoopla, um, which is a electronic materials service that we added to our, um, our suite of opportunities for digital checkouts. And um, so 500 of those digital checkouts were directly the result of Hoopla, which is the, that new service that I mentioned. So we're really enjoying that um, and excited to see how people begin using it more and differently. Um, it's a really nice complement to what we already provide through Reads. Um, so that's, that's been great to see. Um, I wanted to explain, I had a question about the courier loans. You'll see that we're way over what we were um, in previous years. You know, we're at 68% above, 88% above. And ordinarily that would really concern me um, because if we are open to the public and we are relying on um, such a heavy amount, an increase of materials being borrowed from other libraries, it tells me that our collection isn't necessarily meeting the needs of our general public. But when I asked our circulation manager, Celeste Peck, um, for a little insight about what might be leading to this increase, she said that, well, it's just because people can't browse. So a patron's only way to select materials is through the catalog. 
And the way that the courier system works is it's just going to route whatever title they request from any location to our library. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they're requesting books we don't have. Um, it's just that they can only request things through the catalog um, that are going to come from whichever library has it available in that moment. Um, so it's not going to wait for a book that we have to be returned from a, for one of our patrons is going to send an available one from Bristol or from Unicoi County. Um, so that's part of it too. And then also sometimes when people request books through the catalog, particularly if they're in the building already, they've gone to the shelf and found that it's not there. Um, and sometimes they pick an alternative title. This is happens a lot. Um, and so that's an aspect of circulation that just that experience is not there for people right now. Um, so I think that when we do reopen the facility to browsing again, we we can fully expect to see a decline um, in those courier loans. Um, but I just I wanted to explain that what that was because it was a little bit surprising to me and continues to be at first I thought it was just you know things kind of evening themselves out um, as we were reopened but but this is truly what's happening with that part of the collection. Um, just one other thing about Cirque that I wanted to show you. This chart here, um, the 2021 owl stats. This is affectionately referred to as the Kathy Hall chart because it was always her favorite. Um, because we, as we like to say, you know, it's certainly not a competition, but it is always nice to see how well we're performing within the broader context of regional library of the libraries within owl within our region. Um, so you can see all these libraries during this time were just doing curbside service. Previously, some of them um, were open by appointment for various ways of allowing for browsing, that kind of thing. Um, but because of the recent surge in cases in the months of December and January, um, we were all just doing curbside pickup. So it's a pretty good um, measurement of how well um, your library staff is performing right now um, in meeting the needs of our community. So that's great to see. Um, but we've had a really great uh, February and, and January. Um, we, wrap it, we are wrapping up the Own Voices Winter Reading Challenge right now, um, which has been incredibly well received from the community. And we have had um, fantastic programs for all ages as a result of that program. Um, Dr. Carter helped and lend a, lend, lent a hand for a book discussion as a component of that. Um, and so we've had Joy Fulkerson, former board member, of course, um, helped, helped with one of the adult programs. So we've had a lot of um, really positive feedback um, from the community as a result of the Own Voices Winter Reading Challenge. So that's been great to see too. Um, other things on site, we did reintroduce the Employee of the Month program is back. And I'm pleased to say that the January Employee of the Month is our Assistant Circulation Manager, Xander Murray, who not only does he get the praise of his colleagues, but we have a newly introduced, I'm gesturing like you can see it, um, staff Employee of the Month parking spot for him. So he truly has a place of glory um, to be recognized publicly for his hard work and determination. Um, so we all applaud Xander, he's fantastic, and we're lucky to have him here on our team. Um, and I think that's really, you know, as far as this part of the report, um, kind of the in and out of January for us, we are happy as you are to continue to, oh, I'll talk really briefly about um, some facilities things. So next month, if cases allow, I'm hoping that we can maybe have our meeting back on site uh, in our meeting room. And one of the really exciting things about our meeting room right now is that it's being painted. And so you may remember that it had 20 year old wallpaper in it. And uh, several years back, our facilities manager, Mike, tried to strip it and stripped a lot of plaster along with said wallpaper. So we just, you know, painted over it and pretended like it never happened. Um, and we were thinking, okay, we've got the time. Maybe we should really look at stripping this wallpaper and just resurfacing it um, to make it all work. And they started kind of picking at a corner like you do when you're picking at wallpaper and it just came right off like butter. So <laughs> our two facilities guys stripped the whole room in like an hour and a half and are now, then they sanded it all down and now they're in the process of painting it. Um, so for coat, coat number one is about done. Um, so we anticipate that the meeting room will look just fresh and beautiful um, for y'all next time we can get together on site. Um, so really happy about that. Uh, so by the time you come back in here, I, I know I keep talking about all the fun stuff that we're doing. Um, I think you're really going to be pleased with how beautiful everything looks and clean and shiny and also new and nice again. So really happy about that. Um, the other big news is that we have uh, made some progress with the renovation of the services department. Um, Sarah has been kind enough to help us um, form a little committee to work on getting a mural done on the um, exterior of the services 
um, story time room wall and helped us realize find some artists to talk to. So we're in the process of scheduling visits with them um, because we are happy that we have a pool of local local talent. Um, so we're going to bring some artists in to take a look and um, give us their vision for what that might look like. So really exciting things happening in that department as well. So are there any questions about anything right now? How is the employee of the month selected? So it's a peer peer nominated process. Um, staff send me emails and nominate um, someone for it's called the above and beyond award. Um, and then I monthly select the person. Um, and traditionally they were given like a pin and a certificate, um, but we added the parking spot just for a little something special yeah. too. Yeah, good. Um, I, if you wanna hold this to the last item <clears throat> on the agenda we can, but I wanna, um, I got my buy a brick flyer in the mail today. And I wanted you to tell us a little bit about that and sure. the background. Fantastic. Uh, so as part of our 125th anniversary celebration in 2020, whoops, we were planning on having a, our, a fundraising opportunity. Uh, folks can purchase a brick to be installed in front of the library for $125. Um, and so this is not something that we do regularly. Um, it's just an, a commemorative um, option for um, for giving to the library. Um, so we did do a very large mailing, larger than we usually do. <laughs> so I think, Kathy, what was it? Over a thousand were sent out? 963. 963. Wow, that's great. I folded all of them, I think. You did. <laughs> yeah. I posted it on social media. <laughs> But so we, we did a great job and we have received several. The, the great thing is you can go online and order it and do everything completely there or mail the form in. Mm -hmm. And it's working very well. So and it's fundraisers limited. They do a great job and we're excited to be doing it. Sorry. <laughs> I love no, stuff. Fine. This so is we'll several, we do it every five years, it seems, when we have a momentous event. We did it for our hundredth, hundred and tenth, fifteenth, twentieth. And now our 125th. So this is about the fifth or sixth time that we've done that since I've been here. That's great. Okay. So and we're closing sales in June. So and then we can get them ordered and installed hopefully in the early fall. Is the plan. Um, President, is that it? Any other questions of Julia? Yes, Sarah. Um, I will just say that a few years ago I got a brick, but you know I've never found it. <laughs> You'll have to show me, Kathy or Julia, okay. sometime. <laughs> we will. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I don't know. I keep looking. It's there, but <laughs> no way. Maybe it's you need to cost. make a brick map so when people come in there, they're <laughs> framed and they can go directly to it. That's a great idea, Susie. That's wonderful. I like that. Yeah, that's a volunteer job, I think. Yes. <laughs> Community <laughs> service, maybe. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. I think it might be a treasurer job. Oh, oh, wait a minute, Tony. That's accounting involved. <laughs> Objection. Um, uh, I don't have um, any other items, I don't believe, other than um, I'm glad that uh, Julia said the heating is still working in the in the library and with no problems. So, um, Amy, could you give us a hosted regional report? Yes, I can. Um, I don't have too much for you today. Um, just our, our CARES and tech grants are still going on. Um, CARES goes through April, or um, I'm sorry, CARES goes through May and tech grant through April. So if you have any questions about any of those, I'll be glad to answer them. Um, this week or um, the 25th is the last date for E-rate. If you do E-rate, that's the last day to get that all submitted and turned in. Um, they just wanted me to remind everybody. And, um, and some good news, we finally have a date for the new Tennessee State Library and Archives grand opening. Um, it was supposed to happen last fall, but you know, the world fell apart. So um, we are expecting the grand opening to be April 12th. They are in the process right now of moving everything into the building, all the new furniture, all the offices are being moved right now. And, um, and April 12th is the expected grand opening date. So um, if anybody is in Nashville anytime after that, please go over and take a look at the new um, TSLA building. I'm sure there will be tours 
constantly for the next year or so while they uh, get used to the new building. So um, other than that, that's all I really wanted to talk about today. If you have any questions for me, I'll be glad to answer them. Okay, thank you, Amy. John, welcome to the meeting. I hope you're not still driving with your cell phone in your hand. You're actually in my passenger seat. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry I was late to the meeting. That's not a problem. We just didn't want you to get a fine and go to jail because of us. <laughs> um, Absolutely. We're going to move into old business, and that's a reopening discussion and recommendation. I know Julia wants to open as soon as you can, but what's the, what's your feelings and thoughts? Um, well, as you know, I sent out the latest um, local snapshot, and the data is promising right now, to be sure. Um, I, I feel like um, we've seen this before, and I'm nervous to get my eggs in a basket or to get my hopes up, but it is really promising. And um, we do know that the city um, has put forth a proposal to the city, city staff have put a proposal to the city manager who will then pass it on to commission. Um, asking them to consider reopening city facilities in April. Um, and I think that there's no reason to suggest right now that we probably couldn't do the same on site. Um, however, I would feel more comfortable, and I think the staff would too, if we were given the opportunity to have some sort of a soft opening prior to a public announcement. Because one of the things we've realized um, is that the staff need to get used to being with people again. Um, <laughs> You know, I had we had a meeting to talk about the um, DNI statement, which we'll talk about later. And it was one of the first meetings that I had had with six other staff members in a space um, that wasn't a virtual space in a while. And it was really strange being together in a room with folks who are not in your immediate department. Um, and so I think you know we've tried so hard to stay so safe as a staff um, that it's just going to take us some practice to get used to that again. Um, so I think that for us, we're, my plan now is to start with daily, um, we used to think like morning meeting where we just kind of gather in the break room and talk about the day and what's going on and talk about our favorite cereal, very important stuff. Um, and so I want to start by bringing that back, um, socially distantly in the, um, common area in front of the circulation desk, and we'll sort of ease our way into being around others. Um, the next thing I'd like to do is invite you guys to come visit some friends of the library members, um, walk through what we have set up, um, and then from there, just magically one day unlock the doors and have a bit of a soft opening um, so we can really practice and tweak what we have in place. Um, and then hopefully we'll be ready for a public announcement of reopening a press release marketing and that kind of thing, explaining to folks that we are back open for the next phase of our plan, which again is not a full the way we were reopening, it is a, a step um, towards restoring full services. Um, but I think that, so I what I'm really asking for you to do today um, is, because I know back over the summer when I was really frazzled about constantly examining the numbers and making the decision and all that, I asked you to kind of take that away from me and um, make the decision a month to month, which has served us really well. But I think what I'd like to do now is to get your permission to make the decision when the moment feels right for our staff um, so that in, Feb in, in March, really, um, probably at some point, we can think about unlocking the doors and experimenting with usage a little more. Sure. Um, so that's kind of where we are now. I'm hopeful. I'm also really, I was telling uh, Tony earlier, hoping that we can get the staff inoculated in the coming months. Um, we are not, we were sort of just, we by librarians across the board, were kind of just overlooked when um, those who were making the decisions were making decisions about distribution of vaccination. Um, and so different municipalities and counties are interpreting it in vastly different ways. So some counties have already inoculated staff because they're county employees. And some areas have inoculated staff because they're city employees. And yet others are saying you have no priority just when your age bracket comes, that's when it's gonna happen. Um, so it's really all over the place. Um, so I've been doing whatever I can locally to try to encourage um, the folks at the health department to think about us as maybe social workers. Um, may, I, if only we were educators, you know, but we're not. Uh, we're not elementary school teachers and that's fine. Um, but I do, 
I do want to advocate for the staff to be inoculated as soon as we can, um, because when we get to that point, I feel more comfortable really restoring our original hours and maybe thinking about having on site programs for children again and that kind of thing and we'll get there. Um, I just I know that for the staff in particular they they would feel much more comfortable if we were inoculated as everyone would. Um, that's not to say that the well, I assume the city's going to be having those same concerns about the community center, the senior center. So if we have the opportunity, let's jump on that bandwagon. I um, I tried that, but the, the actually the city staff who work at the community centers were not given the priority either. Oh, okay. Um, that was a hope I had. Uh, so that's a bummer. But but so, anyway, so if you know anybody <laughs> with a stash of vaccine, yes, Susie. I can't remember if we discussed uh, limiting the admission to a certain number per hour and people could sign up to come in to browse and check out. Did we discuss that? So we have a plan right now that uh, limits the number of people in the building at any one time. So we're limiting it, we're limiting it to 50 people at a time in the facility for browsing. And there's not going to be seating available or games or things like that. It's really just going to be material selection um, and 20 minute computer sessions so folks can come in and use a computer. Um, we will make an exception to that if they need to use a computer for longer periods of time for proctoring or to file their taxes. Um, we'll set something aside for them to be able to do that. Well, now, are you going to give them a time limit for being within the building? No, we hadn't planned to do that. I think the volume that we're looking at it just we did, couldn't find a way that was really feasible to cap people's time. But again, it's just for material selection. Um, and if we get to a point where there's a long wait, I imagine we'll do something. We had planned to put a message over the PA system saying, you know, there are folks waiting to come into the use of the library. Please make your selection of materials and uh, come to the circulation desk to check out. So I, I don't anticipate too much, too many issues with that. But that was kind of what we were thinking that we would just give a friendly reminder to make your selections and move on. So would you okay. like, um, would you feel comfortable, more comfortable if the board um, made a motion to allow you to do a soft opening uh, during March with a target of doing, of having um, the library open and publicized by April 1st? Um. April 1st or April, April 5th is the Monday, which is when I think the city is okay. planning on starting the, on the plan. It depends on which facility, um, first or fifth, either one is fine. Um, and we can talk about the firm date of that at the, we meet on March 16th, um, this board does. So if you wanna find that date, then that's fine too. I'm hesitant to say a firm opening date yeah. at this point because it is still February. Um, but I, I think what I'm asking is if the board would make a motion to allow me to make the decision um, for for when we should reopen. And I'll, of course, email you and keep you in the loop and let you know what's going on. And if you have objections or feel as though the moment is not right, I am I would like to hear that to be sure. Um, but I just want to make sure that I can act with agility if we feel like it's if we're ready and we're just by golly want to open the floodgates. <laughs> I'd like to be able to do that. Okay. I will. Uh, does anybody want to make that motion? I will. I would move that uh, that Julia be given the authority to uh, reopen both on a soft basis and more formal basis um, as she sees fit and um, as she feels is safe and comfortable for the staff. I second that. I'll second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Who was the second, I'm sorry? Uh, uh, David. Aye. Okay, well, thanks David. David or Daryl. <laughs> all right, I'll pick, thank you. <laughs> and uh, Julia, the the presentation of the reopening, I, I think, is scheduled to be presented to the commission this coming Thursday. For all of the uh, all of y'all that enjoy watching meetings and being on Zoom, so you can log in and watch. Okay, fantastic. If John, if you have any <laughs> strings to pull to help get the staff 
vaccinations jerk them. Jerk them, don't pull them. <laughs> um, new business. Uh, well, diversity and inclusion statement. Uh, Daryl, would you tell us about that? Sure. Uh, as we discussed last month, uh, Julia asked me to take a look at this and I agreed. And uh, I did reach out to her the next week with a statement, I think at the end of the next week. Um, and I know that the staff wanted to get a, a hold of it too, to take a look at it. Um, and what you see uh, before you, I, I believe is what the end result of that was. Um, I think it's a, it's a good statement. Um, I think it says what we needed to say. It's highly digestible. Um, I know that uh, there were some questions about that last sentence um, being a little bit awkward. Um, I, I agree. Uh, I think Julia agrees. But um, uh, at this point, you know, I think we, we're ready for some discussion of this um, before we move forward. Um, Julia, is that uh, the way you understand it? Yes, sir. I would love to have um, everyone's suggestions. And um, as Daryl explained, it's, it's it's with something like a diversity and inclusion statement, we found that it's difficult to balance um, expressing very complex you know, issues and thoughts and feelings in a way that is digestible. And so, you know, we're, we're really trying to strike that balance. Um, so I think that, you know, there's always room for improvement and the staff, we kind of just got to a place, a place where we thought we've just got to stop picking at this and <laughs> give it to the board so that you guys can pick at it a little bit too. Um, so I would love to hear um, any suggestions you have. This is John. I was just curious what was awkward about the last sentence or what, what was the conversation around that? Sure. Um, the, then this one that I have now is actually an update <laughs> from, from when it was originally sent out. Um, it did read that um, we will ensure that these, we will ensure that we live these ideals through reflection of ourselves and our organization. Um, and I think what we're struggling with with that one is just to find a way to give some sort of an accountability statement. Um, so our promise to that this isn't just something that we're gonna put on a wall or put on letterhead. Um, and so we weren't really sure if it should be library staff and government governance or just we will strive. Um, so, I, so we were just kind of having a hard time with the language there. And then um, we did make that other suggestion to, um, to the organization reflects these ideals and all we do, which I like, which was, um, Scott edit that. So I would be happy to eliminate words or add words. Uh, I would I mean, take out the, oh, excuse me, John, go ahead. No, no, I, go ahead. Okay, I would take out the will. I mean, I'm, I'm an editor or, you know, English person, or maybe we all are. Uh, the library state governor strive, we strive to ensure, yeah, because it is in, a, in the present moment what, what we are doing. That's great. And, and again, I'm, I'm new to this uh, conversation, um, but is the crossroads of the Appalachian Highlands needed or is, I mean, since it is the city yeah. library, your library um, provides- yeah safe spaces for all people of our rich and diverse community and, and i'm yeah i'm not i'm not one way or the other about it i just didn't know if it was necessary i think the reason that the staff liked appalachian highlands at one point they had it as broad as northeast tennessee or tennessee um and i think it sort of speaks to the fact that we we do have many people coming to this library who also use other county libraries and choose to use Johnson City, but also, um, you know, we we're sort of the 
I don't know, the leader in public librarianship within the Appalachian Highlands, I think, uh, you know, slightly biased opinion, but um, I think we wanted that in there. But also, I, I think your point is well taken that at the end of the day, we are here to serve Johnson City. Um, and so perhaps it is too broadly focused. Um, so maybe something like our community would be really what we want to put there. Um, yeah, I don't think people have latched on to the term Appalachian Highlands just yet. Yeah. No. In, in <laughs> it's that's what I know. I, yeah. <laughs> so maybe just. Maybe. I don't think so either. Um, Sarah, I disagree with you. I like the word will in there. It, it shows a commitment and it shows that if at some point down the road, we need to correct some service or activity or person, it says we will do that. Sure, go ahead and put it back. You know, it's- That's just my two cents Editing. Away. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not an English Never. major, but <laughs> so is, would it be better to put it at um, the library staff and governance strive to ensure that our organization will reflect these ideals and all we do. Oh, I, like I, think, I think we yeah, need to take out take out governance altogether, replace it with board of directors. Too. The the yeah, government like governance is not a person. Governance is something you do. Okay, the library yeah, governance will yeah. 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 I think that's capital too, B and D. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, I know you're typing and can't do everything with. No, it's good to describe the library staff and board of directors will ensure that our organization reflects these ideals and all we do. Do we want the will there or? Take it out and move it down like John said to yeah. will reflect. I like that. I'm comfortable with that. Do you like it, Tony? Yeah. I agree. That's good. Library staff and board of directors ensure that our organization will reflect. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about community again. So now if we don't have Appalachian Highlands, we have community again immediately, which I don't think is good. It doesn't sound good. Um, so do we want to- Do we have to have it period? Do we have to have that wording period? Well, yeah, we could replace it with the Johnson City Library Service Area or something. Or you, you could take it all out. You could say, your library provides safe spaces for all people of our rich and diverse community. Or was that? I like that. I'm just yeah, trying I to. Too. And then it's shorter, I, which is nice. We liked we liked the idea of it being. That's old. good. All right, let me just like and this is the Johnson City Library. It's not the Washington County Library, the Gray Library. It is the Washington County Library. Julia, is it safe spaces or a safe space? I don't know which one makes more sense in the... We liked the idea of multiple spaces. Okay. Because it's virtual, physical, intellectual. I think it looks good. I like it. Yeah. It changes. Yeah. See what a group of smart people can accomplish. <laughs> well done. Um, do you do we want to do we want to come to a conclusion on this today or do we want to ask um, Julia and um, Daryl to do any final wordsmithing based on our input and consider I, it next month for passage I'd like you to adopt it today so that it can be something that we review uh, annually in February Okay. That's okay. Oh, that's. Is this, go ahead. Sorry. Is this, this going to be part of like a, a vision statement or in or separate or? Sort of. How, how, so we have our um our value statements, of course, and then we have our mission and um and we haven't had a diversity and inclusion statement, but I think that it is becoming increasingly important that we have one, and we are 
of course, you know, the city has recently completed their strategic plan. And so we're in the process of identifying ways that our organization can kind of fit in with that. So it's all sort of part of a broader um, review of our organization and what we're gonna be doing moving forward. Cool. Okay, there's one more thing. Yes. Your, your, well, oh, you are. Oh, you're here. great. That's kind of, you know, it, it's not um, consistent with the rest of the paragraph. I think you would want, I mean, unless you just prefer that, uh, but it, normally you might say this library or yeah. the, the public library or. So we've started using that, and I, this might not be the place for it, but I can tell you why that's there. We have started using your library language more in our public communications because we want the community to feel more ownership over the organization. Um, but I don't know that this is the place for it in a statement like this. So. It, um, well, I don't really have one way or another. It just stood out to me. Yeah. That's all. That's a, that's intentional language that we've been putting in our marketing materials. I like it. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> I think, I think it looks good. I think, uh, you know, the, 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 the statement itself is, is really good. I like it. The next issue from my perspective would be uh, I like to know what everybody else thinks about it, but uh, we need to look at the strategic plan. Uh, and this needs to be uh, any type of DNI or ENI needs to be in a in the strategic plan because that's where the rubber meets the road. And so when we're talking about issues of hiring, when we're talking about the issues of promotion, we're talking about issues of program offerings and who we're targeting and uh, you know things of that nature. Uh, that's where it really becomes important because statements are important. It tells people your values, but statements get forgotten. Uh, uh, they're forgotten fairly quickly, including by the very people who wrote them. Uh, but we should be uh, adhering closely to what we've put in the strategic plan. Um, that's just my thought on it. I couldn't agree with you more, Daryl. And right along with what Daryl was saying, Julia, I was going to ask you if you would next week, next month, uh, assuming we pass this today, I'd like uh, some plan for how we're going to display this. Um, I see a, a plaque or framed pieces on the wall in the literature. How are we going to make this a public statement? Yeah, I think that's part of what Daryl's getting at. We, we not only have to live by it, we have to speak it and show it and and be proud of it. You know, it's funny, often, as you said, people tend to put these things away and we worked really hard on those value statements and I find them to be incredibly useful tools when we're going back, trying to make decisions about things, reviewing policies, making choices to just remember to come back to our values, particularly now as we've been closed. Um, it can be easy to lose sight of the why and um, find meaning in things sometimes. So I think this this will be a great working tool. If we recognize it as a tool. So one question, Julie, and really, yeah. so Daryl mentioned, Daryl, you mentioned promotion, hiring, things like that. That, and not to suddenly throw a wrench, but I'm curious, I mean, the statement as it's written, and I, I really, I think it's very good. It's very externally oriented. Is there something that needs to happen to address things like you mentioned to make it internal enough, or, or do we think that's implied? And I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what I feel. How I feel my about my that. perspective, Scott, was uh, that it's implied there, but that's why I'm mentioning the strategic plan. Um, that, maybe, that, maybe that's enough that's if, the internal if it's soft. embedded within a strategic plan, it, it makes it more explicit than implied by right. its inclusion. So. Yeah. Well, and that we stand for equity of access, really. To do that, it's going to be internal. So I was really, I agree with what you're saying, Scott. But I was reading that into that stand, that statement about equity of access services, spaces, collections. 
Yeah, I mean, I like it as is. I just want to make sure since I hadn't thought about what Daryl mentioned, I just want to make sure we all agreed that that was, this does, this does enough of that for our purposes. And, and I think too, that that first sentence um, is, uh, it has the word inclusive and welcoming. And it's the, the most um, meaningful word, if you would, would be everyone. And so just like Julia says, she goes back to the values um, statement when they look for um, other things as to just be included in that is a, another um, guiding point to use for everything um, that, that involves the, the library, both internal and external. And, and just for further clarification, when I wrote the original draft, uh, I use those value statements that, that we are that we have posted in the in the on the library website to kind of guide that first draft before I turned it over to Julia. Yeah, we could tell, and that's what we were like. Oh, he, <laughs> we could definitely see our voice and our values in that draft statement. It was perfect. Okay, Ju uh, I haven't been watching the screen, Julia. Have you been making changes? I have. Yes. Okay, so what's on our screen is the current version of our working draft. Are we ready to make a stick, a stick in the sand and say this is it? I think that's this is it. I'm pleased with this statement. I would make a move that motion that put the stick in the sand. Yeah. I mean, it can always be changed. You know, we can always go back to it. Sure. All right. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, any further discussion on the motion? Okay, all in favor of uh, our, I, I'm proud of this, all in favor of this document being uh, uh, approved and put into effect immediately, say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. I'm proud to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm looking for my, there it is. Um, thank you, Daryl, very much. We appreciate it, your effort. You um, um, help encapsulate that in four sentences. Mine would have been a page, so. Uh, I appreciate it. I think a lot of credit goes to the staff and Julia. Um, we need to hear about the library operating budget proposal for 2122, Kathy. I think Julia and I are going to tag team on this one. Okay. So um, let me pull it up. Yeah. I think Julia's going to start and we're going to go back and forth. It, um, it's a, always a jumping off point when we start this because, of course, we don't know what our allocation will be from either the city or the county at this point. Do we have any, we know the county decided to cut theirs for this year. Do we know if that was temporary or? Well, the county did cut $7,500 and that came from the Imagination Library. And I have uh, asked for that. The county request is due by March 12, I believe that's the date. And I have requested for um, our funds to be reinstated to what they were pre-pandemic. Yes, sir. I'm asking for that this year. Good. Okay. So can you, can everybody see it okay? Mm -hmm. All righty. So this I is, can, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I, I will just address that a little bit. I think there was hesitancy to maintain uh, the previous funding because we didn't know how the pandemic was going to affect the tax income is the impression that I have gotten from Mitch, uh, Meredith, and others at the county level. So um, it, evidently, we've done real well in our collection. Good. 
That's what we heard as well, Susie. And he was very gracious about it and definitely worked with me. And he's he's always open to listening uh, to our requests. So thank you. Yes, it's, it's really good to work with Mitch. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and um, talk through the proposal and Kathy is going to jump in. Um, We'll just start from the revenues anticipated for the coming year. Um, you'll see we are asking for a 5% increase from the city. Um, and this is designed to do a couple of different things. Um, the first thing it's designed to do is to provide a 4% increase for staff, which would be the final year of a um, pay scale adjustment that the library started a few years back. Um, and so we do know that the city is trying to do the same thing for their workers. Um, and so if the stars align and um, funding comes in as the city hopes it does for their folks, we're hoping to be able to do the same thing for our people. Um, additionally, that helps offset some costs for lost revenue. If I scroll down just a little bit, you'll be able to see that there's spaces where we're looking at um, where we would ordinarily have revenue streams that we do not. Um, for example, this year we took a big loss on uh, meeting room rentals. Um, we couldn't take any money and ordinarily we would take in several thousands of dollars per meeting and we're going to have a little bit. Um, ordinarily we would have fines and fees coming in. This year we did not have any fines and fees coming in because of the pandemic. Um, and we aren't really sure what we can anticipate in the coming year um, with regards to fines and fees and probably will not take much if any in, in the next year. Um, we have seen a decline over time as, uh, with fines and fees anyway. Um, once we instituted auto renewals, um, we had de decline, decreasing revenue from already fine. So that continued to. And one of the biggies that's kind of sort of the unsung hero of our internal revenue sources are our copying and printing of revenue streams. Um, so we're hoping to get some of that back. Um, but again, we're just not really sure what the next year is going to look like. So we are also asking for the city to help fund some of that. Um, there is an additional couple thousand dollars in there. Um, Amy mentioned E-rate funding earlier, and we are applying for a very large scale project in the coming year using that E-rate funding. Um, we need to upgrade the wiring in this building. And so Eric is putting together a proposal now to uh, remove all of the old wiring and put in CAT6 wiring. And I'm not even really sure what that means, um, but I know that that's what um, a 21st century infrastructure requires. Um, so that's what we are working toward. Um, and then there's one other new thing in here um, that's a little bit different. Um, and down here at the bottom, there's the $63,000 um, one-time city allocation. And what we're gonna be doing, I'll show you what that money is for. I'm gonna share a different screen. There it is. So one of the things that the city had in their plan that they'd like to do are some projects to help improve quality of place. Um, and so in looking at that and looking at library services, of course we are a city library and we are a single location city library. Um, so we thought that a nice option would be to purchase and install these smart tech um, little mini novel branch libraries. And it's basically an RFID vending machine. Um, so folks can come in, they scan, I'll just click there to make it bigger. They scan their library card right here um, and then the door unlocks and then they can select materials or they can return materials and the machine will read what they have and what they've returned. And then when they close the door, it prints a receipt of whatever they have. Um, so it allows for 24 seven access to materials and collections, um, physical items. And so we thought it would be really um, beneficial for our community because we are just here um, to purchase two of these and install them at different locations in Johnson City. Um, and they are surprisingly portable too. Um, so we could put them at one location and kind of give it a test run, see how it goes. If it's not being used, we could try another location. Um, so that's pretty cool too. So that's what that part is for. How many of those machines with the 63,000? Two. Two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so let me go back to the proposal. So that $63,000 pays for two of those locations. Um, so let me keep going down. 
Okay, so again, back to personnel expenses, always our biggest um, portion of budget is gonna be personnel, which is true of any organization. Um, and now this part here, we'll move a full-time librarian who's currently an hourly librarian back to salary. Um, and it's gonna add back vacancy savings from an unfilled professional position and then put that 4% uh, raise for staff members in there, that final adjustment, which again, this is the final one of a three-year plan. So this is not a pattern of 4% um, raises for staff. So that's what that is. Um, and of course we do have some just basic things. We're hoping to do some uh, travel for staff again. We were not able to do a lot with conference training this past year. Um, and that's something that I really believe in um, and offering to our people if we are able. So as we scroll down, not too many changes here in general supplies. Um, we did want to pad a little more into public relations again, keep it at that $7,000 level. Um, let's see if there's anything. It's pretty basic stuff with this one. We did pull some of this out. So public service supplies is a new line item for this year. Did we recently add that 52013 one, Kathy? Is that what that change was? That, that actually used to be just for uh, youth services supplies. But what we're finding is that our department heads, they're doing such a great job with these programs and outreach that they need the ability to purchase items without having to dip into other program budgets. So this is strictly taking, say for example, uh, they need a huge amount of construction paper to, to beef up their supplies. That's what that entails. So it's something that they can go ahead, plan on it, and have a set amount each year. And it's actually taking some money away from general supplies as well. We're going to break that down and let them have their own line item and let them live within their budget. And they do a great job otherwise with their materials. So I think this is just adding a layer of help to them as they uh, prepare to open and they get their program started. Operational expenses. The only new line item in this one here, I believe, is the clothing and PPE line item. That was one that Mike had requested. Um, but these are all original line items. Is that correct, Kathy? It is. And the, the really good, actually, some things have changed just a smidge. What we did in the past is we broke out every little thing as far as, oh, you know, somebody coming in maintaining our plants and our um, you know, our bug guy coming in. Those were all broken down into little individual line items. So if you look now, we have a 53051, which is routine and maintenance and repair. We have the lighting, the grounds maintenance, and then equipment service and inspections. That is going to be your thing. Say, for example, our front doors. Those have to be inspected every year. Our fire extinguishers, our sprinkler system, and then uh, the contracted services those are um, other things like our HVAC system. And it just puts everything in a good place. It, it puts our cleaning guy that does the carpet. It, it takes away some line items that were underused and just really not necessary when it could be under a broader account code. The money is pretty much the same. And I have to say that Mike's done so much this year with the budget that he's had. That's why there's such a great decrease in that routine maintenance and repair. You're gonna be so thrilled with the way this building looks. Um, a lot of great things have happened. So we won't be doing that again next year though. <laughs> Does the contracted building services include the public safety officer? Or it does not. That's actually in another account code 5702. Be a little later. Um, no changes in technical services. So there are going to be some changes in materials and services. Um, young adult wanted some stuff moved around. Um, we are, if I scroll down, um, looking at the way we're doing the electronic materials is a little bit different. So it used to be that um, this wasn't spaced out completely the same way. And we would have, we had a broad databases and electronic this might change later. Um, right now, Hoopla is coming out of this databases and electronic materials line item. Next year, if we are really seeing a lot of traction with Hoopla, we may move some of the money from this line item down into adult and juvenile electronic materials and YA electronic materials because 
we'll be doing more regular reporting within Hoopla to see how that money needs to be spent. But for right now, this is our starting point um, for that service. So that's what that money is right there. It's a little bit kind of confusing the way that it is. Um, it's just because it's such a new product, we weren't really sure how we we're gonna be able to do cost breakdowns for it. Um, let's see, I'm reading program all departments. Um, again, that's everybody, they kind of set their own budgets and split within. And we don't budget anything for the friends of the library. We don't budget any revenues or expenses. That's something that is, is great that we can ask them for money. It's kind of like a little mini grant and then they let us have it. And then later on, we'll come to you with an amended budget and put the revenue and the expense where it needs to go. So, Julia or Catherine, uh, just because I, I was thinking about it earlier, the, um, the 4%, is that to that line item or, and then within that salary, uh, general ledger, you know, one employee may actually see a, a 6% increase and another a 3% mm -hmm. and it's an overall or is everybody across the board just 4% based on where they are? It's, okay. an, it's across the board. Last year we did more individualized adjustments since we didn't have as much to play with, but this year it's just an across the board. And then um, where does, where, where, where do our staff sit in comparison to others in the region or, or is there any information on that? Like, I have not seen data on that. Kathy, do you have anything recent? It's been 2008 since we've actually had that pay study. I think the last one that the city did, it included us and it did compare us to other libraries in this area. And we haven't had anything since then. We generally, it, we compare ourselves to comparative city positions and in the pay scale there, we do work with Steve and look at what's going on with those city staff positions. So are we close, below? Above, we're ahead. a smidge below. I think we're still a smidge below, but we're, we're getting there. That's the good thing with this initiative that the city came up with. I mean, it's been wonderful for us as well. <sighs> it's about three, four years ago. That allows us to get more in line with city positions. And I, I will say that we don't have anyone at minimum wage, which is great. We have a couple of shelvers that are about 8.25 an hour. So uh, we are definitely doing better. Okay, thank you, thank sorry. You. No, that's great, I love questions. Uh, do, have, has the library ever had uh, groups or either friends or even our board like every month when we get to meeting in person, bring say packs of construction paper, things that would uh, be easy for us to pick up at Target or someplace and drop off and negate expenditure. Not to my knowledge, occasionally if we need something, we will just go to the friends for that and ask them to purchase it. Mm -hmm. um, so if Betty needs a batch of some very specific supplies, for example, she needed special supplies for this thousand books before kindergarten program, so we made a request to the friends of the library to help cover those supplies. Additionally, we do get really lovely donations of items from Joann's. <laughs> so we'll get fun seasonal stuff from, from Joann's a couple of times a year too that they can use. Um, and we get bulk discounts. We do get some really great discounts from um, A&W office and other office supply places and we take advantage of every coupon and every discount that we can possibly take advantage of. But we don't turn down donations, but we, we wanna make sure that we have what Betty needs. For example, if she needs a certain type of paper or color for a specific program, a lot of her things are very specific mm -hmm. and she will choose what she needs for that particular one. You know, I, I, I think, Office Depot used to have a program where you go and you buy something and you could say I'm with Fairmont Elementary or whatever. There may be a group of people that aren't associated with an elementary school. I'm wondering if the library could sign up for that program if it's still available to where, you know, when you go in and shop, you can designate the donation to go to the library instead of an elementary school. That's a good idea. I'll, I, it sounds like I think Target maybe used to do that too. They used to, to look into that. That's a good idea, John. It is a great idea. We are set up with Office Depot tax exempt and have, you know, a, that kind of account, but any extra layer would be great. 
Okay. Where was I? Okay, so uh, IT, uh, of course, uh, we could add money to this as much as we wanted for the rest of our lives and there would never be enough. Um, but right now we do have that uh, just $13,000 increase penciled in um, and then an additional $3,000 for software needs in the coming year. And that I think is specific to um, those um, vending machines as well. The equipment, um, that's really just a starting point. We know that this project is going to be very large. We also don't know with complete certainty how much E-rate will pay for um, because we haven't received the full report from the schools yet. It's based on the number of children who are eligible for um, free and reduced lunch through the public school system. So right now, uh, I talked to someone at the school today to try to get that data and she's gonna try to run reports. They've had all of the children in Johnson City Schools on free lunch this year um, since they've been back. So, um, so I'm not sure it was something they'd really been looking at very much, um, but we do need it to file our E-rate paperwork. Um, going down, this is the line item you were, you were asking about the security, um, 5702 right right there. Um, that is where the officers are as a line item. And I do like that it's its own line. Um, it's very easy to express to people how much we do spend on our off-duty officers and we're fortunate to get them here. Um, they certainly do um, help ensure that we have less issues. Um, and often, you know, there's this perception, Kathy and I were talking about it with a, a newer co or staff member, one of our colleagues who hasn't been here um, long enough to have been working in the library when we were open. And they had a question about um, officers and you know, having them here during all hours of, that, of uh, operation. And I kind of laughed and I said, well, that's sort of the, what we want people to think, but the truth is it's staggering shifts. Um, and of course we, we simply don't have the resources and I'm not sure there's a need to have them here every hour of every day, but it is nice to give the perception to the general public that they're always here. So I hope I didn't let the cat out of the bag too much in this uh, recorded public meeting, <laughs> but, um, but certainly during curbside, we do have them here um, during all hours of curbside operation so that folks feel comfortable opening their trunks um, and waiting for their books to be delivered to. Uh, and, and they are 1099 contract labor. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's see. That is, oh, there's a 63,000. That's the city. That's that project that I mentioned with the vending machines. Um, and then the ETSU Elevates grant, we were fortunate enough to be awarded that last year, but we had a fabulous week of programs and events for teams planned for last May, um, which we still have planned and, and not executed, but we are ready when the time comes and it is safe to have that program and spend that money down. Um, and that's, I think, where we are. Were there any other questions? I'm sure there's lots of questions, actually. I don't know why that just jumped like that. So I don't want to try to make you dizzy scrolling down quickly. And the capital project there is the youth services renovation that $105,000. And that was our donated money. That was not tax money. And we have a balanced budget. Well done, Kathy. Well done, Julia. <laughs> <laughs> we have definitely worked together on this. <laughs> do you talk about it so much better than I do, though? I'm like, I like to talk about the fun stuff, and you talk about the numbers. <laughs> that's, that's fun stuff to me, so. <laughs> I'll do a hoopla demo or explain how to use a vending machine or, <laughs> or why I think it's important. That we have lots of really um, exciting plans for things we could do um, in the future. And, um, and one of the things we've talked about, as Kathy mentioned, that the capital project for these services renovation was um, money that was left to us um, from an estate. And if there's money left over, one of our hopes is to purchase um, a vehicle for the library so that we can do outreach a little more in the community. Um, I think that we really, um, and the city I think is interested in this as well, um, need to get out and really go to people where they are in those underserved areas of our community. So we're looking forward to finding ways to do that and have a presence a little more um, in and of the community. Questions, comments? Okay. Uh, I would ask for a motion for approval of this proposed budget. I move that we uh, approve it and accept it. And a second, please. I'll second. 
Thank you, Jennifer. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 And opposed? Um, before uh, Julia, just a note for you, uh, at some point at a future meeting um, in your report, give us an overview of, of the machines and where you're thinking they might be placed. And just, I think we're all curious about that and maintenance and security and all those issues, I think would be an interesting item for us. Um, I want to move into the Imagination Library budget proposal. Okay. This one is, is going to be pretty straightforward. We are asking for the same amount of money from the city of Johnson City. They've been very gracious for many years, and we can live within our means there and reinstatement of that $7,500 from Washington County. Our donations have decreased significantly for the Imagination Library. That's one of those things where you don't know. We have no clue if someone would prefer for their contribution to be given to the library or to Imagination Library. And this year, if it's any indication as to where that's going, so far we've received $152 in outside donations and $24 in miscellaneous revenue. So that is why the decrease in donations and miscellaneous revenue for the upcoming year. So the total revenue is $68,700, which would be a net increase of $4,900 for FY21-22. And then as far as expenditures go, uh, I'm not sure when the, the new census is going to release the data on the eligible children in Washington County. Currently it's 6,666. Children roll off the rolls as they become ineligible because of their age and they're added when they're born. So we're looking at $67,000 for a monthly book purchase and we are paying for the little engine that could again. Then registration materials, postage, that's allowing us still to get those good addresses and that has truly saved some money in the long run. We are no longer seeing those undeliverable books being destroyed by the post office. So we're very grateful for that. And then uh, bank fees, those are a minimal fee. The travel expense, every couple of years, there's an opportunity given by the Dollywood Foundation for additional training on the program, any new updates, anything that would be beneficial for us. And so that is a small amount. If there is a, an actual training this year, we would like to go. Celeste and I went a couple of years ago and it was great. And it definitely helped us as we move forward in, this, uh, in the Imagination Library. And if there's not one, then that money can be rolled right back into another need or it'll be carried over into the next year. That miscellaneous is just something, we did a little push on Facebook to get some additional donations this year during the, um, the launch of Dolly's movie. We still haven't received that, but we wouldn't go any more than $50 to promote anything. And there again, that might not be spent at all, but. This actually does uh, present you with a balanced budget as well, uh, 68.7 in revenues and 68.7 in expenditures. Okay. I like questions. Questions, anyone? Just out of curiosity, um, and I, I know I when I did my donation, I did it online. Does it indicate anywhere, and I, just because I've slept multiple times, <laughs> that anything would would need to go to the amount, like do we express as a whole that we'd ideally like monies to go towards the Imagination Library or is it possible to say if it's not designated that it can go there? Like what are our parameters and what are our means to sort of get those donations boosted to sort of compensate for Washington County? In the annual report, it actually has an opportunity for folks to designate their contribution to the Imagination Library. We don't solicit that so much. It's one of those things where, because we're the 501c3, that's why the Imagination Library came to Johnson City Public Library. The Chamber of Commerce used to administer the program. And until it's necessary to raise additional funds, we had some retained revenue that's allowed us 
to manage this year and to keep things status quo. But if we had to sustain another cut or we didn't get some funding reinstated, then I think that's when we would make a greater push for donations to the Imagination Library. And also there's a little known thing that happens if, for example, we can't meet our monthly book um, you know, payment to the Governor's Early Literacy Foundation or to the Dollywood Foundation, then the GELF will step in and help. There are funds for that and counties that aren't as well funded as we are, they do take advantage of that so that those children have no lapse in their delivery of their books. Right now we're good. I have in the past written grants to several different foundations that were very successful and some of them weren't. But there are so many people out there looking for funds that until it's, it's a greater need, we're, we're in a good shape. We're so fortunate to have support from the city and the county. We're, we're not all cities and counties support their imagination library like ours do. But it's, it's a great question. Have we... Um had any publicity in News and Neighbor recently on the Imagination Library? We haven't specifically done any from our organization. There's been a, a really big push from the Dollywood Foundation uh, when her movie came out. And I do think that that's going to result in some pass through money to all of the affiliates across the state. But we haven't done that specifically we can and they have done. I've actually spoken on um, you know, Channel 11 and been interviewed by News and Neighbor in the past, but I believe that what we're doing with getting those good addresses has truly saved us some money. It's, it's amazing. If you look at the life of the program and you've got 200 kids and it's $60 each for five years, I mean, and that's just a, a ballpark. I think that we've probably had several hundred that we were able to remove from the rolls where it was just a completely undeliverable book. We haven't asked for any great increases from the city or the county in years. I think it's been a couple thousand dollars maybe over the last four or five years. So it's a sustainable thing right now. Other questions? Um, I would accept a motion to approve. I move that we approve the Imagination Library budget as it is. Second. And the second came from John? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, seconded. And all those who approve say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, that is Thank you. Right. now we get to you get to start working on the revisions now. <laughs> um, and we need to talk. Um, um, Julia needs to talk to us a little bit about the Library Foundation Fund responsibility. Yeah. So we there has has been a fund at the East Tennessee Foundation that. Um, was started with the only designee uh, recipient as the Johnson City Public Library. So a group of very kind, lovely people started an endowed fund at the East Tennessee Foundation, said only the library can pull from it. They met, they had this fabulous board, and then they stopped meeting. And when that happened, the library became the custodian of the fund. We became the fund advisor. Um, and the problem with that is that it is not a legal investment for an organization such as ours that is held to a government standard of audit. So the only way that we could get this fund we, um, off our books because it's an endowed fund, it's pretty tightly established, um, was to find a community member who at one time had a closer than they do now relationship with the library to reinvigorate the um, advisory board of the Johnson City Public Library Fund. So Kathy Hall, former board member, has taken that on, <laughs> thankfully, and found some folks, uh, Marcy Walker and Chris Jenkins, to serve as the initial members of um, this advisory fund. And so 
they met, they elected um, officers and they adopted bylaws, which were strikingly similar bylaws to the original bylaws um, that that first group used, uh, very strikingly similar, um, and have reached out then to the East Tennessee Foundation. And, and, and at this point, the folks on record who are fund advisors are the board members, Peppy Hall, Marcy Walker, and Chris Jenkins, which is as it should be. And our audits, our auditors are happy with this development, um, but have asked this board to formally acknowledge that we no longer have any custody or anything to do whatsoever with anything that happens with regard to the East Tennessee Foundation's Johnson City Public Library Fund. Um, the only exception of that, of course, is that I, as library director and any other library director after me, will serve as an ex officio member and also the secretary so that someone ensures that meetings happen and that minutes are kept so we don't inadvertently uh, not have meetings anymore and then the fund comes back to the library. Um, and so the, the board plans to meet quarterly right now. And after the quarterly meetings, I'll certainly update you guys about their activities, fundraising plans and that kind of thing. Um, and so, at one time, I think there were some interest in establishing like a true foundation for the library. But um, as it stands, we have an endowed fund, which is different from a regular foundation. And you, you all might be pretty familiar with what an endowed fund is. It's simply a different style of giving. Um, and so I like to explain to people as, you know, you're, it's a gift that ensures that the library has funding in perpetuity. Um, because we can only draw from a portion of earned interest, of course, annually. But you, the more you grow the fund, the more you could potentially draw in annually if you wanted to. Um, so there are some benefits and it's just um, different donors prefer different styles of gifts. So this is just another option. Um, and eventually as it grows, there's not, and I don't, don't, me, don't let me mislead you. There is not hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting in this fund. I wish it's more like, I think we got up to $12,000 maybe. Um, maybe a little more than that. A no. donation recently, so That's I think right. it's about twenty-one, maybe. Yeah. So it, it's not an exorbitant amount of money, um, but it is still a start, and it exists, and so we're we're happy for that. Um, and I think that there's a lot of energy by the chair, in particular Kathy Hall, at helping this uh, little fund grow. So. And Karen, Karen McMurray said all along that one of the reasons for starting a foundation is so that you would have a 501c3, and we are a 501c3, the Johnson City Public Library. And Karen has spoken with me on several occasions. This actually started when we did the fundraising for this building and has been going on this long. And we, for it's a different iteration, but it's been an issue for a lot of years. So will this, does this take care of that exception that every year during the audit that they we've talked about yes yes okay and i have a question mm -hmm. uh what is the percentage is it done that way anymore that the east tennessee foundation receives it you is, know uh, for their fees um Correct. for their fees i'd have to look sarah i don't know off the top of my head I'm sorry. I can I can look into that and let you know. I'd be happy. Okay, that would be good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, is the proposed practice be, would be that the 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 library, Julia, you and us would approach this committee with fund with projects or funding requests or. Yes, years down the road when they have enough money for us to ask for money. Um, because again, it, as an endowed fund, um, we cannot, mm -hmm. we don't have access to the balance. It's just right. on, you know, a percentage of earned interest. And so, yes, so that would be the process we would, um, if there's something we'd like to fund or if it gets large enough, we could potentially fund a special project for a couple of years or a position. There's just a lot of options with how you want to use that fund. Um, but we're, we're just so early at this point. Um, it's a nice thing to have as well, so that if someone were doing, um, you know, estate planning and that kind of thing to know that if they wanted to leave uh, monies to something uh, like a legacy for the library, they could contribute to this fund, if that was something that were attractive to them. Um, again, it just speaks to the way that different donors like to approach. Sure. Um, 
and and Kathy, this doesn't at all interfere with um, those of us who want to buy a brick. Or, no, sir, it does not. Uh, or, or send in a cash donation for something. Not at all. It, and it, it's a good thing. It, it allows me to remove, if you look at the balance sheet in your board packet, you will notice if you take action today to remove us from anything to do with this fund, those monies will come off our balance sheet effective immediately. And that will also remove it from the audit and any discussion from our auditors, which it comes up every year, that the East Tennessee Foundation invests in funds not approved for municipalities of which we are a quasi-governmental um, you know, organization. It's on that, I'll, I'll scroll up and show you what she's talking about. On that first sheet. Yes. Oh, back up. There you go. It's, it's at the it top. Right and, and what they do is the, there's the total at, and then at the bottom, that's the asset. And if you look at the bottom there, because um, there could be an endowed and non-endowed, Julia, I'm not really sure. At first it was a little bit of both, but if you'll scroll on down and you'll look at the total capital, the non-spendable is 92.66 and then what is restricted is 23.90.49 and then the current earnings, it's about $119 a year is what the fund is earning. Okay. That'll all go away if you approve it. Questions? This is a little confusing, I know. So everybody know what we're doing? Okay, I will um, I accept a motion to um, that we acknowledge that the Library Foundation um, fund ha uh, has a steering committee. Is that the correct term? An advisory committee. An advisory committee. Yeah, they're the fund advisory. And that, it, that is separate and independent from the library. Perfect. Is that a correct motion? Yes, sir. OK. I'll make the motion. Thank you, John. I'll second. Thank you, Scott. I have another question. Okay. Um, how long are the terms of the advisory committee, and um, how are they? How would they be chosen or nominated? Sure. And who would be doing that? Is it the committee themselves? Yes, they're three-year terms, and so after the first year, they'll be soliciting more members to the committee so that they're staggered terms. Um, so in the coming year, they'll be looking for new membership. And so the nominations will come from the committee itself. Okay. Uh, they're originally, and that's a, a good question actually, Sarah. And I mentioned that the bylaws were strikingly similar. And originally the preference was for the library board to make recommendations for the advisory board. But that's really, that gets us into trouble as well because we have to have completely separate relationships um, between the two. And will the committee grow or is that? Yes, ma'am, it will. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you right. know anyone who might be rolling off of the library board in the coming year, <laughs> uh, or to, I think this year or next year maybe, um, who, yeah. who has a love and commitment to library and library work and might be interested, I would be happy to suggest to the board that this person might be soon eligible and interested, if that's what you're getting at. No, no, I wasn't. I just think it's important to have a rotating advisory and a board of directors. It's really important to do that. I just was curious how that would be done. Thank you, Julia. That answers it. G Julia, could you, uh, there's no reason we couldn't read, see the policy. Um, there's no reason. I can actually, what I'll do is create a um, another <laughs> You know, I love that shared drive. I'll create another folder in there um, because all this information you are welcome to have. Um, and I'll just start putting the East Tennessee Foundation Library Fund information in there so that you have access to it anytime. I as think well. that's appropriate. Sure. Okay. Did we vote? We didn't, did we? Yes, sir. Uh, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 
All right. So we've solved a problem that they were talking about when I first came on the board. So that's nice. Um, I don't think we have anything else to discuss today. And I'm looking out the windows and it's almost dark, so it must be time to adjourn. Any other issues? I move we adjourn. Susie Second. says we're done, so I adjourn the meeting. And we're meeting in person next time? Uh, we'll see. I think I'll, we don't have to decide that right now, but what I can do is when we get a little, the, the date and time will not change. It's still going to be, um, of course, oh, am I screen sharing? I'm sorry, I'm still screen sharing. Um, the date and time will not change. It's still going to be at 4.30 on March the 16th. Um, so regardless of whether it's virtual or in person, um, it's your choice. I think the governor's order extends through the end of this month, but maybe not March yet. Amy, you might have to help me on that one. Uh, yeah, it extends through, last I heard, through the end of February, um, but it'll, we'll know the last day if it, if he extends it or not he usually cuts it pretty close to the wire so we are keeping an eye out for it and as soon as i see anything in either direction i will definitely let y'all know okay so we'll know ahead of time yeah well i'll let you know regardless though the, the time will be the same all right everyone